you are listening to Harvest Bible Chapel KL. For more information, please visit our website at www.harvestkl.org. Um, we're going to uh, continue in our series called Faith for the Future. We've been studying the book of Daniel, so turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 9 this morning, and uh, we're going to continue to look at God's Word, although uh, a bit differently uh, than we have in the past. We've been doing the study, Faith for the Future, talking about the things that God has very clearly prophesied are going to happen at the end. And I believe that as we understand those things, it is a faith-building experience. That as we've seen how God has prophesied about things in the past and how He has fulfilled those things, showing that He is faithful and true to His promises, we can see then in the things that He's promised in the future the things that we can trust Him for as well. And so this segment of the book of Daniel that speaks about the prophecies of the end times is rich in opportunity for us to grow in our faith and understanding of Him. But Daniel, interestingly, does a gear shift and moves from speaking about the end times into an amazing prayer in Daniel chapter 9. And so two weeks ago when I was with you and was preaching, we looked at Daniel, we kind of combined 8 and 9 together, at least the prophecy portions, and we skipped over this prayer. We only briefly mentioned it, but I wanted us to look more deeply at this because I believe it is a faith-building uh, faith building prayer that we need to see as a model for how we too pray, specifically prayers when, it is when we have need of confession. So um, that just took all the air out of the room. Who likes to talk about confession? Anybody like to do that? Uh, let, let's have a confession session. Everybody's like, ah, where's the exit? Got to get out of here. Got to leave for something here today, right? Because nobody likes to admit that they're wrong. Nobody likes to show that there's something that is sinful in them. And so we oftentimes, we, we try to avoid those circumstances. And so I want to tell you, you didn't know you were going to do that today. I don't want to I don't, I don't want your heart to feel too, uh, too insulted by me preaching about these things here today. Um, I, we're going to do this gently, okay? But, but something powerful happens in this book of Daniel where he begins to see the prophecies that has got, and God fulfilling them, and he falls into this amazing prayer of confession, and, and he wants us to see really, uh, I believe God left it in his word for us to see how we too can do this. And so uh, today's message... Faith to confess my sin, and I'm not talking about uh, faith as, as in, like, am I strong enough to do it? I'm talking really more about why would we even endeavor to do this? Like, what is the reason behind why we would have the confidence that I could reveal my sin to God, that I could admit and agree with Him in those things, and even do that with others around me as well? And so Daniel chapter 9, we see his realization and then a confession and prayer a pausing from the end times things. Now, in the book of Daniel, we've seen that God sovereignly protects in every situation those who are loyally standing for Him, those who are loyal to the things that He calls them to. And this is one of the harder things that He calls us to, but I want you to see that he, God is faithful and He sovereignly protects us even in this. We've seen really how we can trust God for the end things in chapter 7 and how He has all things in control in chapter 8 and in the midst of Daniel realizing those two concepts, he comes into a spot where he just falls down and asks God for mercy. So that's hard to do. That's difficult at times to do, to, to fall and ask God for mercy. What is the, pro what is the problem? How, I know that there's times where I need to admit that I'm wrong and I need to confess sin, but, but I oftentimes fail to do that very thing. Why is that? Why is it that we know we're supposed to do one thing, but we actually do the opposite thing? Think about reasons in your heart for a moment why that might be true. Why, if you know that God has a certain way of doing things over here, do you choose to say, you know what, I'm going to skip that. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do something different. It's going to look like this. It's my own way over here. Why do we do those things? Well, it's interesting when we see what God's words has to say about confession. He, he has some things over here about what we're supposed to do. In, 
In, in 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess, is what 1 John says. If you do it, there is an amazing, amazing forgiveness and cleansing that happens by God. So why do we choose to not do it? In James chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power and it is working. We love the second part of that verse. Oftentimes, we forget the first part of it. If you confess your sins to one another. So, Pastor Nate, wait, you're telling me I'm not only supposed to confess my sin to, to God, but I have to tell other people that I've done some wrong things as well? James 5.16 is telling us that we are to do that, that we may be healed. There's healing that comes between two individuals when there's confession is what we're finding. So why is it that we choose to do something different? Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13 says, Whoever conceals his transgressions, his sin, will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. You know, so many times we're on this thing, this challenge to prosper in life, but we forget that God's way of prospering is by confessing, making sin known to Him and to others, that there's going to be mercy granted in that, that there's something prosperous that happens as a result. But when we conceal our sin, when we do it our way over here, we will not prosper. So why don't we do it? In Psalm chapter 32, verse 5, it says, I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Wow, that's an amazing realization. The psalmist is writing here saying, I'm not covering it over. I'm not doing it my way. I'm doing it your way. I'm going to confess my sin. And when I do that, you forgive my sin. You know, so many times we walk around in life burdened by significant things that are the result of unconfessed sin. And even though we're burdened by those things, even though we're challenged and, and disciplined by them, we don't turn and repent and confess our sins, but we continue to bear those burdens, living stressed out lives, unprosperous lives, lives with no healing, in opposite of what God has called us to. Oftentimes we do this because we just have in us this, I don't want to admit that I'm wrong. Who hates to admit that they're wrong? I do. Sometimes it's, it's I know that I'm wrong, but I'm embarrassed that somebody would know that. Is, is, would you ever be embarrassed to tell, raise your hand if you'd be embarrassed to tell somebody that you were sinful in some way. Is that true? Yeah. And so we need to go to the Bible and, and, and not only see what it has to say about confession, but let's look at a model for how it was done by really an amazingly righteous man. Not perfect. Daniel was not righteous in his own ways, but he lived a faithful life. And he lived a life to be modeled in so many ways. And the way that he confesses his sin and the sins of his people is a model for how we too can do the very same thing. And so let's look here this morning at Daniel's confession. And we see here, in ver let me just read. Um, I've been debating what to do here. Let's, let's read as we go. Daniel chapter, one, chapter 9, verse 1 says, In the first year of Darius the son of Assyrsus, the descendant by Mede, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. And really what we're doing is we're picking up the storyline of the end of Daniel's life. This is the king that's also called Cyrus earlier in the book of Daniel. And the year 538 BC, when Daniel was an 80-year-old man. We're seeing it at the very end of his life. That's when this is happening, when many things have happened. It says, in the first year of his reign, in verse 2, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet must pass before the end of desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. Daniel was reading God's word. And as he read God's word, it enlightened his mind and, and, and brought him to an understanding that he's been in the, in the country of Babylon in captivity for 68 years. 
And God promised that when year 70 rolled around, they would be released from their captivity. And he sees the truth of God's word and he does the simple math of it. Notice, I love how he interprets God's word. Literally. We can interpret the word of God in a literal fashion. We don't have to make up an allegory. We don't have to make up symbolisms when the word of God doesn't do it. It's just plainly reading. When 70 years comes around, I see something's going to happen. And I want you to notice that confession is, first of all, a response to Scripture. And so you have some notes in your paper, in your bulletin. I would encourage you to pull these out and write this little pattern down for what confession is. But can I encourage you, like maybe ha- like halfway, two-thirds of the way down the page, just cross a line across the bottom there, and we're going to do some work at the Don't write anything under that line, okay? We're going to do that later. But everything now up on top, here's, here's, a, conf- here's a pattern for how Daniel actually prayed prayers of confession. Number one, we see here uh, that he aligned himself with God's Word. He aligned himself with God's Word. Now, I believe that other things can cause us to come to a place where I know that I need to confess my sins. I, I, I could get caught in sin and realize, like I remember literally uh, playing out in my mind, my mother had a little uh, cookie jar and it was shaped like a frog. It was this porcelain clay cookie jar and the head came off and and you reached in and you got cookies. And I remember I, that the whole cliche and everything, I got my hand caught in the cookie jar. My mom was standing there saying, are you taking a cookie? And I was like, no. <laughs> but I was. And I was caught. And, and I knew I needed to actually, I said no, but I knew I should have said yes. I should have confessed, right? Sometimes it's just a sense of, I've done something wrong a few days ago and I'm feeling so guilty about it. I know I need to take care of it in some way. Oftentimes that leads into a place where there's pain that's caused in my life. And those are the things that oftentimes bring me to a place where my response needs to be that I would confess. I will admit to you that there's not only Scripture that brings us to our need to confess, but Scripture brings the greatest clarity as to how I need to confess and why I need to confess. And this is what happens with Daniel. Daniel's reading. It says, the word of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a prophet about his time and age, and Daniel was able to get a copy of the book of Jeremiah, and he's reading it. And we can see in Jeremiah 25, verses 10 and 11, and in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 10, that God said that for 70 years you'll be in captivity, and then we're going to let you go. Daniel realizes that's supposed to end very soon. He does this math and realizes it's only a few years away. And he realizes that the right response at this moment is to repent because the reason that they're in captivity is because they have sinned. And Scripture enlightens his mind and brings him to a spot where he realizes now's the time. It's going to happen. We should have done this already, but we haven't. And that's why Scripture is so important that we would have a daily intake of it that we would learn to hear God's voice on a daily basis so that we would see God's word and know, hey, my life isn't like that. I need to do something different. I need to do it his way. And and confession begins when we align our lives with God's word. And we see the perfection of who God's character is and the perfection of what he demands out of us and realize I'm not like that. And so now I need to confess something. Confession is a response to Scripture, we see, first of all. But let's keep reading. He goes on and he says, Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking Him by prayer and pleas for mercy, with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and I made confession. Put a big box around that. Made confession. That's the point of this whole section of Scripture here. And said, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps the covenant and steadfast love with those whom, who love him and keep his commandments. We need to stop there. Here's a second step that we take. We need to secondly appeal to God's mercy. The Bible tells us how to confess sin, and it says when your life doesn't align with Scripture, you need to appeal to God's mercy. Notice here how Daniel did it. He said he turned his face to God. He, he He turned and he gave a determined look until like he was gazing, staring at God. I, I, you know how like when you're talking to somebody and they don't really have their eyes connected to you, but then their eyes lock like right onto you, right? And it's like, there's this intensity of like, we're communicating with each other. And and that's what Daniel's doing. I turned my face. I, I forgot about all the other concerns of my life. And this was the focus. 
Not only that, we see his fervency in the fact that he, he's fasting. Not only is he gazing into the eyes of God and saying, I need to get this answer, I need to get this figured out, but he's not even eating, I'm, I'm not going to take any meals on board until, until this is figured out. And it says here that he's, in, he's changed his clothes and he's in sackcloth and ashes, and that's demonstrating his great humility. He's not staring in the face of God saying, you need to do something for me. He's staring in the face and he's longing for God, saying, I'm not worthy. I, I need your mercy, is what's going on here. Fascinating here that he's asking for mercy from God. Two words for two names of God are listed in, this, in these verses. It says, Then I turned my face to Adonai, the Lord God. Adonai is the name for God that designates that he's the owner and the ruler and the sovereign person who has the power to actually change the situation. So he's appealing to Adonai, but then he goes on to say, I I, I prayed to the Lord in verse 4. And you know, whenever you see the word Lord in the Bible and all four letters are capitalized, look at verse 4. In the English, when all four letters are capitalized, it's saying something very specific about the name of God. It's using the personal name for God, Yahweh. Yahweh was the personal name that was given to his covenant people that demonstrated that he had great love and care and concern for them. And so when Daniel says, I'm praying to my God, I'm praying to my Yahweh, he's talking about there's this personal relation. It's not just the God who's big and powerful and out there that could change things but isn't concerned for me. It's this God who loves me and knows every detail of my life. And he's my father. And he has a personal connection to me. And that's the God that he's appealing to. And he prays prayers of mercy. Please, God, don't give me what I deserve. It's a prayer of great humility. It's not demanding something of God, but it's one that is is pleading out, but really from a place of softness of heart that says, "I, I don't deserve to receive what I'm asking for. And I know that, but I'm asking for it anyway based on something different. I'll show you what that is in just a moment. You know, oftentimes we change and use the words interchangeably, grace and mercy, but they're very different. Grace is the idea that I get something, I receive something that I don't deserve. But mercy is the idea that I don't get what I should receive. And in the case when we're confessing our sin, like I know, the wages of sin is death. I should receive death for this, but God, I, I, I'm, I'm asking for something different. I'm asking for life. I don't deserve it, and so I'm appealing to your mercy, and in that I'm admitting that I'm wrong. Really, that's the third thing that we're called to do here and that Daniel does. So he aligns his life to Scripture, and then he appeals to God's mercy, and then third, he admits that he's wrong. And it's fascinating how he does it. Let's read verses 5 to 11 together. It says, We have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. What's that verse make you feel? If we're honest, it's, man, I'm glad I don't have to say that verse. I'm glad Daniel's saying that verse about them and their problems, right? Right? Because nobody wants to say these words. Nobody wants to actually... Let's read them again. Verse 5. We have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. Daniel names six different aspects in which they were wrong. Sin, doing wrong, wickedness, rebellion is number four, turning away from the law is number five, and not listening to the prophets is number six. And he goes on, and in the 15 verses that Daniel is speaking, he says 25 different times, we sinned. Not all the same way, oftentimes different ways, but 25 times. When's the last time you prayed, and in your prayer, you 25 times admitted that you were wrong? And yet this is the model of Daniel. That if we're going to pray prayers of confession, we have to admit our wrongness. Now in this, let's continue. 
It says in verse 6, We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke your name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and all the people of the land. Not only does he identify that, but then in a shocking admission, look at verse 7, To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us, open shame. Open shame. In other words, I, I was kind of thinking this way. Like if we put up on the screen right here, all your sins from the last 24 hours, that would be open shame. Nobody wants to do that. But that's what belongs to us because that's what we've earned and that's what we've done. And Daniel's admitting that. He said it should be open shame. You're perfect, but I should have open shame. It's a shocking admission and it contrasts the righteousness of God with the unfaithfulness of Israel. Go on here, as to this day, in the middle of verse 7, as at this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel, those who are near, those who are far away, and all the lands to which you have driven them because of the treachery that they have committed against you. To us, O Lord, belongs open shame. Second time, repeat. To our kings, our princes, our fathers, because we have sinned against you. These are hard words but necessary words to be included in a prayer of confession, that there be specific identification of what we've done that's wrong. Not just, I, I, we did it wrong, God, I'm sorry. That's a weak, weak confession. But one that specifically identifies, I did this, and then this, and then this. All to my open shame, I did these things, and they're wrong, and they're so far different than you. Looks at, that's what he does in verse 9. He contrasts God's mercy and forgiveness because of our rebellion. He says in verse 9, to, to the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against Him. He just kind of summarizes it there. And then goes on in verse 10, And we have not obeyed the voice of our Lord our God by walking in His laws, which He set before us and the servants and the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice. And the curse and oath that are written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us because we have sinned against Him. I was reading that and going, oh, what, where was that? In, somewhere in the law of Moses, there, there is a curse and an oath written that we are now living out. Right in your margins or in your notes, this is Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28 is where this is found. It's in the law of Moses, right? Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 15, all the way down to verse 68, I believe, is the full explanation. I'm not going to read all of it right now, but let me just read some of this. It says here, But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God, or be careful to do all His commandments and His statutes that I commanded you today, this is at the end of Deuteronomy, Moses is restating God's covenant with the, land, with the country of Israel, with the people of Israel. He's saying, if you don't do these things that I've commanded to you, Cursed shall you be in the city. Cursed shall you be in the field. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall you be when you come in and go out. Cursed shall be, you'll be when you go out. The Lord will send you curses, confusion, and frustration in all that you undertake to do and destroy the, and perish quickly on account of your evil deeds. Later on it says the Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. And then a little, little later, the Lord will bring you and and your king whom you set over you to a nation that neither you nor your fathers have known. And they're in the midst of that right there. And it goes on and it lists very carefully the things that, that are being referenced here. Daniel's saying, I know what these things were and they've all happened to us and they've been right to happen because we've been wrong. Here's the third step of, a, of con, a confessing prayer. It's four, number four, agreeing with God. So as we get aligned with Scripture and we see that it, we're not in the right place, right? And we appeal for mercy. God, did not, we, we don't deserve any of it, but we admit that we're wrong and then we agree with what God has done. Look at verse 12. This is Daniel agreeing with it, 12 to 15. He has confirmed his words which he spoke against us and against our rulers who ruled us by bringing upon us a great calamity. They're not in their land anymore. They've been taken captive. They're now slaves in Babylon. That's the calamity. For under the whole heaven, there has not been nothing like what has been done against Jerusalem. And I was confused by that phrase, but the idea here is that God has punished other nations for not following Him. He's disciplined them. 
but he's never disciplined Israel, his chosen people, in this way until now. And it's amazing to think that God, who is, who is their father, who has disciplined other people who have worshipped false gods, is now disciplining the people who follow really him. That's the amazing calamity that has happened that's not like anything else. As it's written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us, yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. It's like me in the cookie jar, right? My hand's in it. Are you taking a cookie you shouldn't be taking? And I said, no. I'm in the midst of the sin. And I can't even confess right there. And what he's saying here is, we've not entreated your favor, Lord our God, turning from our iniquities to gain it. We haven't done it. And that's why I'm praying. I've realized there's a sin here and I haven't taken care of it, so we have to take care of it now. I'm agreeing with you, God. I think it's so important to see here that Israel, as God's chosen people, are being disciplined. And maybe a little footnote application here is the idea that you and I are not so special to have received the Lord Jesus Christ to still be able to sin and think that God will not deal with it. The reality is, we are chosen and we are loved and we are adopted as His sons. And when we still sin, God still needs to take care of it. And He needs us to take care of it as well. So this calamity has happened, but its purpose hasn't been achieved. God's disciplining those that He loves. That's Hebrews 12, verse 6, right? And in that, they haven't turned to Him yet. Therefore, the Lord, verse 14, has kept ready the calamity and He has brought upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works that He has done, and we have not obeyed His voice. We haven't taken care of this yet, so I'm praying this prayer for my country because we need to confess now. There's this urgency of, I need to agree with God about this, or the calamity will continue. The discipline will continue on. Verse 15 says, And now... O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself at at this day. We have sinned and we have done wickedly. We're agreeing. It's not right. It's sin. And then out of that, the fifth step is to ask for help with humility. Notice what happens here in verse 16. There's a change. O Lord, according to all your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy hill, because of our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem, and to the people who have become a byword among among all who are around us. Now, therefore, our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and the pleas for mercy, and for your own sake, O God, make your face shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. O my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations in the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness. That's really key. But because of your great mercy. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. Daniel's asking for help with great humility here. He's appealing to God's mercy. We don't deserve this because we're sinners. But but he's appealing to the mercy of him saying, but we are your children. We're your children. Don't let us stay in this place. And you just hear the emotion that's coming out in this last section. Oh Lord, oh Lord. Oh, I mean, his heart is broken. He's in tears on the floor, crying out to God for mercy. Hear, forgive, pay attention, act, don't delay. And all of this asking is based upon a right knowledge of God and the confidence in who he is as his child. He's saying, I've completely done it wrong and I deserve nothing. But because of your promise, I'm your child. Would you forgive me? And that's the appeal that's being made. Now that's an awesome prayer. I mean, that's a blow you away type of prayer. And I just have to ask again, why don't we pray like that? Why do we choose other options? What prevents us from praying and confessing in this way to a God 
who is merciful. Well, here's what it is. <coughs> Think about why you don't confess. What are your top reasons for not confessing? And then come in line with the reason why we all struggle in different ways, but around the same thing. The top reason that prevents us from confessing is because I do not believe God. You say, wait, wait, wait a second, Pastor Nate. What do you mean? This is a room full of people who came to church because they believe God. Okay, I get that. I get that you might have come to church and it's because there's been a revolution of your heart that has come to some level of belief in God. Some of you are here and you're kind of still struggling with that and you're like, I'm here to explore that. Others are like, all my life I've believed God, but can I just say that it's not what you say you believe, but how you act that really determines what you believe. And if you struggle with confession, and I think we all do, we have to recognize that disbelief is the reason why we would do that. When I do things that are different than God's way, it's because I have something higher on the throne of my heart. What's higher on the throne of your heart that causes you to not do what God says and confess your sin? Let me suggest five. I think there's more. But five that might help you identify what sits higher on the throne of your heart than God in this. Number one, it could be pride. You're like, I want to do things my way. And there's a lot of us, there's a lot of us that say that. And the idol, the thing that's higher on, God, on the throne of my heart than God is me. My way. I want, God, I want to add God to the things I'm doing and hope that He blesses me in it. And that's not the way God does it, by the way. His blessings come when He alone is on the throne of our hearts. Here's a second reason. I might fear the results. If I told you what I did wrong, if I told you my sin, I would have to face some consequences. And my fear of the consequences are really what is God in my heart because I won't actually do what God says. The idol here is pain. It might be, a third reason might be because of shame. I would be so embarrassed if you knew what I did. You would think poorly of me if I showed you who I really was. And the idol there is other people's opinions. I'm more concerned that other people see me in a certain direction than that God is on the throne of my heart. It might be number four. Ah, it's just the way I've always done it. It's my pattern. My pattern is what's on the throne of my heart. I've always done it this way and I'm not going to do it any different. And I found that when I ignore my sin, I really like that. And the idol is my, my patterns, the crafting of my life. Number five, your idol might be denial. The fact is, we have blind spots, I don't, and I don't want to see what's there. I don't want to see what's behind me. I don't want to see the things that I've done wrong. And so I would prefer you just not point those things out. I don't want to have to confess them. Interesting, I was reading a sermon about this, and there was an acronym in it for denial that I thought was fantastic. Don't even notice that I am lying. That's the problem with denial. <laughs> I don't even, I mean, I might know initially, but pretty soon I don't even notice that I'm lying to myself. And the idol here is a philosophy or a pride that's going on. All of these excuses point towards idolatry. Idolatry is not just the worship of formed images carved out of wood or molded out of whatever. That's, that's, listen, we all have an idolatry problem, not because we have little trinkets in our house, but because we have something else on the throne of our heart. The first commandment is that you should have no other gods before me. And many times the things that are my passions and my desires are the things that are the idol of my heart. They're not a carved image, but my pride causes me not to confess. My 
Shame causes me, and these are idols that are sitting on top of our hearts, causing us not to confess, not to do the things that God has called me to. And so we have to ask, well, then what's the solution? How does this get solved? And the good news is that Jesus fulfills our need and desires and solves our heart issue it's so amazing to see that right here as right at the beginning of what happens here. Look at verse 4. Daniel, he turns his face to the Lord and he's in sackcloth and ashes. That's verse 3, right? And he's pleading for mercy and he prays to the Lord and he made confession and he says this. Look, is your eye, you know where, verse 4? Look at verse 4. Everybody's eyes on verse 4. And then I'll read it. O Lord, the great... An awesome God who keeps covenant, that's number one, and steadfast love, that's number two, with those who love Him and keep His commandments. Here's how I want to show you how Jesus fulfills and satisfies and solves the heart issue problem that you have when it comes to confession. It goes back to this idea that God keeps covenant And we have to do a little bit of a history here. We know that God made a covenant with Israel. Remember when there was a man over in Ur, is what it was called, and his name was Abram, and God said to him, hey, I'm going to make you a great nation, and I'm going to give you a land, he eventually tells him. And then then Abram changes his whole life, and he moves all the way around to the Palestinian strip there, and and he creates a people for himself there, and he incubates them in England, Israel. I'm sorry, Egypt. But then he brings them back, and as he brings them back, he says, "I'll be your God." And they're like, "Yes, you will." But we want a king, and so they get a king and an imperfect leader. And over and over, we see Israel as God's people have something on their heart better than God, something more that they wanted. But in the midst of that. In all of their failures, in all of their sin and transgression, over and over, I mean, uh, how long do you think God should wait to deal with sin? It should be like, boom, right there, done, right? The wages of sin is death, boom, you're, you're gone, missed, right? That's what should happen, but God in His patience and long-suffering made a covenant that he knew the people would break over and over again. And he said, it's going to be a covenant because you need me to fulfill both sides of the agreement. It wasn't a contract where it was like, you do this and we do this, because he knew if he set a contract with his people, they would break it and he would have to kill them. They knew that it wasn't a commitment. Hey, we're going to promise this because he knew that words are fleeting so many times and our yeses aren't yeses and our noes aren't noes. And so they said, yes, we want you to be our God. And then they went and did their own thing. And so it couldn't be a commitment. And instead, God made a covenant with them where he, whereby he said, you need to do these things, but I'm going to be the one that ensures that these happen so that you are actually able to live under this covenant. The condition was that they needed to obey or they would be disciplined. And God is fulfilling His covenant with them because they did not obey and so He disciplined them and sent them to the land of Babylon into captivity. But He's going to bring them back. And that's what Daniel's appealing to. I'm appealing to your covenant. You promised us 70 years and then we're coming back. If we would repent and turn, you'll do this for us. And so I'm praying. (coughs) It's awesome to see God fulfilling this. And it's awesome to know that today we live under something called the new covenant. You understand that, right? That God in His covenant with Israel, when He came and Jesus fulfilled all of the things of the covenant, He said, I'm going to rewrite the covenant with you. And now it's not going to be that you have to look forward to a Messiah that's coming, but instead you're going to look back to a Messiah that has already completed the work on the cross of Je- on the cross, so that the blood of Jesus Christ would pay for your debt, and if you believe in Him, He would give you grace and mercy and forgive you. 
And so that's why when we do the communion table together, when we observe the Lord's table, we celebrate around Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 11.25 that says, in the same way as he took the cup after supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. That's the gospel right there where he's saying, I've made a new covenant. It's my blood that is shed instead of yours. If you believe in me, you have forgiveness for your sins. So we should appeal to God's promise-keeping nature. His covenant never changes. And let he, unless He's made a new one, right? And in this new one with us, we understand that Jesus paid it all. Here's the second thing we can believe in. Notice here, He says, He keeps covenant in verse 4, and then, and steadfast love with those who love Him. This steadfast love is a word in the Hebrew called chesed. Hesed is an amazing concept. The idea of it is covenantal love. This love that can't be broken because God ensures that it happens. And this steadfast love is what we can appeal to when we say God gave us the greatest act of love when He died for us, right? So you know Romans chapter 5 says that the greatest act of love that somebody can do for you is if they would give their life for you. And isn't that what Jesus did? He exchanged His life and He paid for your sin and He paid for it by giving His life and dying on the cross, shedding His blood for you. So that those who were once enemies can be adopted as sons and daughters of the King. That's the steadfast love of God. So when it comes to times of confession, we don't have to go back to our idols where it's my pride and my shame and my denial that's on the throne of my heart. Instead, I can, I can put that to a side and put my eyes on Jesus and realize He's the covenantal God. He's the new covenant through His blood. It's the steadfast love of Jesus that I can appeal to and I can admit, yes, I'm completely dirty rags wrong, but I'm saved and I'm a child and I'm cleansed, and God sees me as righteous, not because I am, but because Jesus puts His righteousness on me. That's why we can actually pray prayers of confession. I want you in this message here today to believe that you can confess your sin. Because the problem is, When you don't confess your sin, you're showing your unbelief. And that's what we've got to deal with. I mean, really, it's kind of cool to look at Daniel's prayer and see it as a model and know that this is how I should do it. I I should align my life with Scripture. Absolutely. And then I should appeal to God's mercy and admit I'm wrong and agree with Him and then ask with humility. That is the pattern I believe we should follow that's being shown here today. But this message and this text is in God's Word not because He's trying to tell you how to do something, but because He's trying to show you why you should do it. And in it, he's gently confronting your unbelief. And saying, drawing you, asking you, inviting you. You can believe. You can believe that I am God and I can be at the top throne of your heart. And you can do it my way. And you don't have to worry about your way that always fails and about other people's opinions and of what you are afraid might happen as a result. Those are all so much less when you see the magnitude and greatness of who God is. I want you to believe that you can confess your sin and that you can bring sin into the light and expose it as we're taught to do in Ephesians chapter 5. Let me just remind you here, Ephesians 5 verse 11 says, Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Hey, listen, you're not supposed to be involved in unfruitful works of darkness, but if you've done that, God tells you the thing you're supposed to do is turn the light on it and expose it, which is an exact opposite of what we want to do, right? And it immediately shows me what the idol is on my heart. The idol in my heart is I don't want to expose it because I'm 
prideful or fearful or denial or... But the Word of God says, expose the sin, confess it, for it is shameful even to speak of the things you do in secret, but when the, anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light, therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. It's saying... You can awake from the dark, dead things of your heart, and if you expose the light on it, the light of Christ is then how you're seen. It's not just exposing what you've done wrong, but it's now showing Jesus Christ is my righteousness. And so we need to expose sin to the light. Reason number one is because God is swift to take care of it. Back to Daniel chapter 9. I love the way this ends, okay? So Daniel prays this amazing prayer and he confesses the sin and he tells God, I'm all wrong and you're all right. And how does God respond when we do that? I mean, that's what you're all afraid of, right? Like if I actually told God what I did wrong, he would like quickly kill me or quickly bring consequence or quickly make my life painful. But notice what he does. Verse 20. You need to see this. Read Daniel chapter 9, verse 20. Get your eyes on that. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of the people Israel and presenting my plea before the Lord, my God, for the holy hill of my God. What an amazing description of what he just did, right? While I, verse 21. While I was speaking in prayer, the man, Gabriel, is Gabriel the man? It's an angel that came in the appearance of man, because we don't see angels, right? So that's why I use the word man. Gabriel, the angel, whom I had seen in the vision at first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. I love that. God's not sitting up there going, I should probably make them feel bad a little bit longer. They need to grovel in their sin, in their guilt, in their shame more. He was like, Gabriel, now! And like, boom! A, a Gabriel show. I love that part of the verse. You're not loving it as much as I am right now. <laughs> Think about how fast can an angel fly? Okay? I don't know the exact number. All I know is, awesome! <laughs> Boom! There! Okay? So that's the first part of it. Swift flight. He made me understand, speaking with me and saying, oh Daniel, I've come out to give you insight and understanding. He's going to answer his prayer about the vision that needs to happen. But notice this, verse 23. This is the best part. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly loved. Okay, so not only, boom, how fast an angel can fly, but like Daniel, he pleads to God for mercy. And what did we just hear? When did God send the answer? Now, I can't flick hard enough right now. Now, like Daniel wasn't having to grovel through all of his prayer of confession before God answered. He answered right at the beginning. Mercy now. That's awesome. Expose sin to light because God is swift to take care of it. And secondly, you've already heard it read, for you are greatly loved. Here at Harvest, we say you are loved at the end of everything we do. And it's true that you're loved because we love you, but it's more true that you're loved because God loves you. That's why we say it. We don't say it because we're such great lovers of everybody who comes to our church, although hopefully growing in that. We say it because God loves you so immensely. And so when we come to a spot where we like, I need to confess, and we decide that, you know what, I'm going to follow my idol of pride instead, remind yourself of these truths. Turn the light on it because God will swiftly take care of it because He loves you and He doesn't want you for a moment longer to be stuck in that sin. He wants to take care of it immediately and make it all right again and have righteousness on you again. Why don't we do this? 
in this, I want you to know that your heart is more sinful than you can imagine, but God's love is more merciful and kind than you can ever hope for. And that's why we do this. That's why we can believe that we can confess our sin. And so I'm going to take some time, and I had you draw a line on your paper, and I'm going to, we're just going to take some time to do, we're going to do heart work. I'm going to have the worship team come, and they're going to help in the heart work, because I think so many times our hearts are connected and affected by music, and we get our emotions involved in this. And so the worship team is going to even lead us right now, but I want to take us through a little bit of a practice in this where we do heart work. Too many times we come to church, we hear God's Word, and we don't do it, and I'm going to give you an opportunity not to just put things into practice when you get to lunch, but we're going to do it now. So on your little sheet of paper there, even if you weren't taking notes, it's okay, get that out right now. I'm going to invite you to see how good it is to turn the light on sin because God will quickly deal with it and love you in the process. And I'm going to put a little grid up on the screen, not yet. And I'm going to ask you some questions and I just want you just to apply it. I don't know, listen, I have no clue and I don't really want to know what sin you need to deal with right now before the Lord. That's not my business. It's the Lord's. I'm going to give you a chance to do that and we're going to sing Amazing Grace in this. Okay? So let's sing the first verse and then we're going to take some time to answer some questions. Just sing with the worship team now. Amazing Grace How sweet the sound That saved a wretch like me I once was lost But now I'm found Was blind But now I see All right, do, do you see your sin? That's the first step. I have a grid here that I want us to use. And I just go ahead and just write down the question, how might I take a closer look at my heart and this sin? And then just answer it. Just go ahead right now. Write that down. I once was blind to my sin, but I, I see it now because I, I see the holiness of God and I see His standard and I know I'm not meeting it. Listen, it might be hard to answer the question, but answer it now because in it, we're going to find some resolution at a swift and loving God. Maybe you've had a chance to identify that. Let's just sing again the second verse of this song and then continue. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear And grace my fears relieved How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. So it's because of grace that we can deal honestly with our sin. And so now we just need to take some time to, con- we've identified it. Now let's confess it. Answer the question, how can I honestly and specifically confess this to Jesus? Think about it. Honestly tell Jesus what you did wrong specifically, like Daniel, identify where you have been wrong. It's His grace that we just sang about that gives us the power to do this. Good to me, 
His word my hope secures He will my shield and portion be As long as life endures Step three is godly sorrow. The question is, how has this sin damaged me, my family, and my community? a hard one to do, but it's a necessary one to do. I think it's important to realize that every time, every time you look at the idolatry, the sin of your heart, that you take 10 looks at Jesus Christ. That's why we're singing this song. It's faith building even as we answer the difficult things. How has my sin damaged me, my family? Write it down. I want to just do the fourth part right now as well, the godly shame part. How has this sin tarnished the name of name and glory of Jesus? It's not just about how it damaged you, but how did it how did it tarnish the name of Jesus? How did it make people cause how did it cause people to think that God is less holy than he is? We're covered by the blood of Jesus, but we have to admit specifically, we have to answer these things clearly. How did my sin tarnish and diminish the holiness of God? Just answer that question. This is heart work, and it is hard work. So we need to hear again the things about Christ. Let's continue to sing. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first That verse is such great hope, and it's the hope that our enemy doesn't want you to have. So we hate and turn from our sin and answer this question, how is this sin my enemy seeking to destroy me? Sing about this great hope, but we have an enemy trying to destroy us, tempting us to think that His way, our way, the world's way is better than God's way. How can we hate this sin, recognizing that it's trying to destroy us? just a little practice that I wanted to take us through that I think that we can do every day. I think we can do whenever we get aligned with Scripture and realize there's a gap and I need to confess something. And I wanted to give you a tool to be able to do that with the hope, the reminder of the hope. My heart's more sinful than I can imagine, but God's love is more merciful and kind than I can ever hope for. It's not about beating ourselves up and feeling bad when we confess. That's not why we do it. It's not to show others that we're sorry. We confess because we have a swift, loving God who's called us to it, who desperately wants to take care of this as soon as He can. He loves us like that. That's why we can just jump out of our seats in celebration knowing the forgiveness that comes from the kindness of God.